Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, Right. <clears throat> this is one of those interactive sermons, right? Yeah. <laughs> you all know it, don't you? Some of, it, some of you because you're Anglicans, some of you because you used to be members of other denominations that say it. Somehow, if you're a Christian of any standing, you know it. It's called the doxology, from a word that means glory, glory to the Father. But I wonder how many Christians who can say that doxology off by heart have even stopped for a moment to think about what they're saying. Well, what what are we saying? That that praise and honour are due to God and that the God who is due this praise is called the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Well, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, therefore, always have existed. They all still exist today. They always will exist. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we believe it because we're saying it all the time. But that's quite challenging, isn't it? The God who is called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always has been. There was a son long before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. There was a Holy Spirit long before Pentecost. And these... Persons always will be. And that's what we believe. And it's important. There are reasons why that doxology is there. Now, of course, today, you see, is Trinity Sunday. Why am I telling you all this? Well, because it's Trinity Sunday. That famous Sunday when traditionally the clergy go on holiday. <laughs> <coughs> That famous Sunday when incumbents give their curates the sermon to do. You will notice that I've come back from my holiday to do this. You will also notice I haven't given my curate any work to do. So here goes. We all know that... Trinity means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But one of the most interesting things of all is is that we say, well, as Christians, we need to believe that. But you can read through the entire New Testament and not find the word Trinity mentioned once. It's not there. And of course, some... Opponents of Christianity will say, well, of course, that proves it never was there. Which isn't the case, but I'll come back to that. This is the belief that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, but they're not the same. These are distinct persons. But although there are these three distinct persons, we only believe in one God. So you've got to get your head around that. And most superficial books say, well, that's a mystery. And uh, they leave it at that. Which doesn't help any of us at all. It also doesn't help, and uh, this is a particular problem sometimes in, in the issue of debating with other religions, that there isn't really a tidy chapter in the Bible anywhere which describes it and sets it out. So that people from other religions come along and say, well, show us what your God's like from your holy book. 
and we can't quite do it as tidily as some of them can, where it's all spelled out, or allegedly so. <clears throat> but we have got to go a bit further than that, because, of course, it is believing in God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which makes us Christians in an orthodox way. Orthodox with a small o, by the way, not a big one. <clears throat> you see, there are lots of groups in the world that call themselves Christian. They're not all Christians. They're certainly not all born again. And the way of distinguishing them from each other is precisely this. Do they believe in God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Because if they don't, then <clears throat> they aren't right. And you meet a lot of them on your doorstep, <clears throat> and sometimes it's very hard to tell the difference. It was quite a interesting, while I was at university, I met a group of Seventh-day Adventists. I thought that Seventh-day Adventists must be weird, crazy, off the scale. When I began to talk to them, I discovered that they actually are born-again Christians. There's nothing wrong with what they believe about God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're fine, so don't be afraid of that. On the other hand, Jehovah's Witnesses are not. And neither are Mormons, because they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They certainly don't believe in the Trinity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I've noticed in talking to Jehovah's Witnesses in recent years that they're becoming particularly aggressive about this issue that I was having a discussion with one who started <clears throat> to, um, to, 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 to tell me this story about how the doctrine of the Trinity was made up by the Emperor Constantine at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. It was straight draw from Dan Brown. A bigger load of nonsense I've never heard in my life. <clears throat> Now, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD is very important, but not for the reasons that he was trying to say. All right? That in the early years of the church, there was a lot of debate, especially in the time when the canon of the New Testament hadn't yet been agreed, i.e. which books of the New Testament were, were to be trusted and which weren't. There was a lot of debate about how could God become a human being in Jesus Christ. Because surely, if God is the unchanging God, if he became a man, he must have changed, therefore he can't be unchanging. You understand the problem, you know? Hard to get your head round again. And <clears throat> when the Roman Empire became Christian, in the early years of the 4th century AD, uh, under the Emperor Constantine, he called together the Council of Nicaea to try, uh, amongst other things, to resolve this problem. And, <clears throat> and, and Christians from all over the Roman Empire at that time came together, uh, particularly uh, one of the early fathers called Athanasius, to try and come up with a wording which would express what the New Testament said and would be able to give Christianity a defined position uh, from, from which it could defend itself against heresy. Okay, you with me so far? All right. Uh, and out of that came what we still call the Nicene Creed. Okay, the creed that we often say in communion services. It's obviously a translation <clears throat> because it wasn't originally written in English. But, um, <clears throat> but out, out of that came the Nicene Creed, the idea that, that, that God uh, became a human being in Jesus and that Jesus Christ uh, <clears throat> was by very nature God and never ceased to be God, 
all right, of one being with the Father and was made man. Okay, so that Jesus never ceased to be God in becoming human, but became human and took our flesh. He wasn't a kind of magic man, he was a real human being. And very importantly, the the Council of Nicaea also established that there was a third person to the Trinity. That the Holy Spirit was not kind of a piece of God or a thing. All right, so you don't refer to the Holy Spirit as it. Okay, this is a person. Right, you got that. So, and and Christians still make this mistake. Right, it's it's important. So, here is the third person. And they express this in the words that say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. He is not the same as God the Father and God the Son, but he is so at one with them that he is God, right? So the Holy Spirit is not a kind of uh, an instrument in the hand of God and Jesus. The The Holy Spirit is God and is an equal person in the Trinity alongside the Son and the Father. So by the time that the Council of Nicaea had finished, there was a statement of faith which we still call the Nicene Creed and which we still teach to confirmation candidates today which talks about we believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth and so on. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord and so on. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And in that Trinity, all right, all of which, and all of those things that we've said are backed up by statements in Scripture in various places in the New Testament. <clears throat> all of those things are vital for us to believe and help to make us orthodox with a small o. So we believe in God the Father, who is essentially the creator, the creator of heaven and earth, maker, we say in the creeds, don't we, of all things visible and invisible, which is a very good way of putting it. We believe in God the Son, who the Bible says had a role in creation, as it says at the beginning of John's Gospel, doesn't it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. By the way, not the Word was divine, as the Jehovah's Witnesses have it. The Word was God, that's the correct translation. But that this... (coughs) But the the word son actually does have its limits. (laughs) You know, if any of us have a son, we can usually place the date when he began, whether that's birth or conception, but you see what I mean. (laughs) So the thing is that these are words which all have limits and the analogies begin to break down sometimes. Okay, calling Jesus the son doesn't mean that he had a beginning that was different from God's. It's a way of, rather, of expressing their relationship to each other. And that's, actually, we sing at Christmas, don't we? Word of the Father, begotten, not created. Some of these carols are good, aren't they? (laughs) we bother to think about them. And that this second person of the Trinity, 
who sometimes we call the Son, is the one who became incarnate, in other words, who took on flesh and has a role as our Redeemer. It was the second person of the Trinity who died on the cross and who rose again. <clears throat> and so, as the Father has this distinct role as the creator of all things visible and invisible, so the Son has this distinct role as the Redeemer who became incarnate in order to bring all of creation back into a relationship with God. And then the Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. That this person is the God who is active amongst us now. Who is the God who we experience. The one who leads us to the full person of God. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because <clears throat> we have a God who is so distinctive from all other gods that it's incredible. The fact that God is three persons and not one means that God has always known from the depths of eternity what it means to be a community and to relate. No other God can claim that. And this God, who doesn't need any of us, has brought into being this amazing creation which he wants in relationship with himself. He didn't need to do any of that. He was quite happy as he was from the depths of eternity. And yet, there is such love which is intrinsic to him <laughs> that he wants all of us to be drawn into that as well. And when we turned away from him, he was not prepared just to let it all go and to say, well, that didn't work, did it? But to actually do something about it himself, to sacrifice himself in order that we could know him and be part of that divine community, as it were. And that we can know something of the divine nature within ourselves as we live in this imperfect world and we become, as Peter puts it in his second epistle, partakers of the divine nature. When we look at each other, we don't really believe it, do we? That's why it's so important. And... We need to reflect, you see, this God in ourselves, this multifaceted God, and in the way that we lead our church life. And, you know, I've, I've encountered churches where they've got this out of balance, churches where all they talk about is the fact that God is the creator of all things and isn't the world a wonderful place. Well, it is. Nothing wrong with that. But there's another story to be told as well. Because they don't say, talk much in churches like that about the fact that there's sin and imperfection around. But there are other churches who go too far the other way and talk about the fact that we're all sinners. And they just bang on year, week after week, year after year about how sinful you are and how much you need redeeming by the work of the Son. It's true. It's not the only story to be told. And then churches who leave the Holy Spirit out of the equation altogether. Well, Jesus is all we need, they say. Well, yeah, I know what they mean, but it's just getting it out of balance. And churches, of course, who only ever talk about the Holy Spirit. And what about God doing a work in our midst today and we can't go home until he has? 
Yes, there are churches like that, believe me. Probably not in the Church of England. <laughs> but there are. But do you see what I mean? This God who wants us to reflect him is showing us these many facets of how he is and says, will you be like that? Will you become part of that? Will you show the world what I'm like? Let's pray that we as a church become reflectors of that God who is the creator, the redeemer, and the life-giving spirit. Let's make sure that we try and keep that as a balance in our church where we don't go overboard on one thing or the other, but give each of these things their importance. And don't start reflecting to the world a God who is much greater than perhaps any of us suspect. Today, it's quite right that we celebrate a wonderful God. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I, I think I'm looking forward to a day when I'm singing, Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. And it isn't just congregations in this world, but all of the host of heaven as well. I'm looking forward to that day, and I hope you are too. And uh, as we sing hymns like that, Let's put our whole selves into it because God is wanting us to join in with all of that. You know, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, oh, some of you know it, you know. Get used to it, folks. We'll be singing it in heaven. And it starts today.